Ruthie Foundation. I would like to thank you for choosing the Jordan Ruthie Foundation as the beneficiary of its spring fair. Community fundraisers are so important to the Jordan Ruthie Foundation. They not only raise funds for better awareness, but for work that we do. We are just told that our applications are up to 68% from last year at this time. Please know that these funds are coming in at a crucial time. Thank you with gratitude, Julian. How do you like that? So we did a good thing there and we received a nice card. And I also received a card from someone else too, that if we ever find it, well, we can bring it and do that as well. All right? Okay, without further ado, everyone stand with me. I'm going to start with the pledges, and um, and then who's doing the invocation? And then Mr. Chuck will lead us through the rest. Okay, here we go. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation. Under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for the kingdom of his hands, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. Our Bible is here. I pledge allegiance to the Bible. God's holy word, I will make it a lamp to my feet and a light to my hand. I will hide his words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Happy Fourth of July weekend. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. The invocation. God with us. You send us into this world as your disciples to of restoration and change. You speak to us in the stillness of our rest and the chaos of a frenzied world. You guide us in troubling times and you move us to dance in celebration. Holy Spirit. Comforter, Mediator, Advocate. We pray that you would open up the heavens and rain down on us. We celebrate our liberating presence, your liberating presence found only in our teacher, the Savior and Deliverer, Christ Jesus. We know that you move when and how and where you will. So rush into Canterbury Chapel today. Breathe on us, refresh us, restore us, revive us, and make us aware of our sinfulness. Challenge us, empower us, then send us to the north, south, east, and west. Heavenly Father, we say yes. We give thanks and praise for your presence among us. And in the name of the one true living and ever living God, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Please join me in the call to worship. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of living in this great country where we have freedom to openly worship you. May we never take that privilege for granted, but always guide and treasure it. May we not live in apathy to you, but live in awe of your love and forgiveness and freely pour out that's freely poured out to us. Allow our light to shine brightly as our hearts turn to you. Let us make a joyful sound to the Holy One. Let the earth rejoice and say, How awesome are your works, O Divine Savior! Creation moans under the pressure of war and communal disconnection. We cry out to you, and the presence of God, and you share and respond. You turn our mourning into movement and stir our souls into action and to rest. And the of God, we will give thanks and praise to you for your clothe us in joy and peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
26, please. Number 26. A mighty fortress is our God. <clears throat>
Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. For lo, haste a day when my faith shall be sight. Truly, Father, that is what we are all looking toward today. The day when what we are believing and hoping for and hoping in, you, Father, who we are seeing and seeking after, will be revealed to us and to all those who are looking for your appearing. But in the meantime, Father, we have work to do here on this earth, in this place where you have planted us as a body of believers called Candlebury Chapel, in this community called Attleboro, Massachusetts, where you have placed us to be a light to those who would seek the truth, for those who would want to know you and be redeemed. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ today that your light would shine so brightly here that men would not only see you, God, but would say, what must I do to be saved? Their lives would be forever transformed and renewed by the power of Jesus Christ. For truly, God, you have a purpose for all things. The earth and all it contains belongs to you. Everything happens according to the counsel of your will. So even now, God, as we are here today, as we bow our heads in prayer, seeking your face for these names that I've written on this paper, before we put these names to paper, you knew it all, and you were prepared and stand ready to answer our prayers as we offer them in faith in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we say thank you in advance for hearing our prayer, for answering our prayer, and for coming and seeing about us on today. We bring before you, Father, in faith, Eric and Kerry, that you would touch them in their bodies in the name of Jesus. We are so grateful to you, Father, for the, for the thanksgiving, or should I say the guidance that you've given this nation thus far. This nation is celebrating its anniversary on tomorrow, but Lord, you purpose for this nation to be here. And I pray, O oh God, that the people that founded this nation, as well as those who live in it now, O oh God, I pray that we would remember that we were founded on Judeo-Christian values, whether people believe that or not. We were founded as a place where men and women could raise up their hands and live, give you glory. I pray, God, that we would remain a nation that allows that today. Father, also I pray for S, and I pray for Dottie. I pray for the Haddon and Benton families, that you would touch, intercede, strengthen, and encourage. Touch Chloe, Father, Anita, Brenda Pelletier, Jim, and Frank. Remember Fran, Father, as she mourns the loss of her husband. Replace grief with comfort in the name of Jesus. Remember Lindy and Linda. Remember our sister Lynn. Father, remember Peyton May, Father, who was a newborn who just joined us. I pray, Lord, that all the days of her life, your Holy Spirit would live and shine in her and through her. She would never know drug addiction. She would never know alcoholism. She would never know any addiction of any kind, but would be a model and symbol of your glory and majesty from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. Protect her and be a hedge and fence around her. Keep back the hand of the enemy and anyone that would wish her harm in the name of Jesus. We bless her in your name today. Father, remember Jane. Touch her and heal her even now. Remember our friends and saints in Afghanistan and other places in the world who cannot worship you, who cannot raise their heads, and who cannot openly call on your name. Touch them, strengthen them, protect them today in the name of Jesus. Give Abby guidance today. Kill Karen today. Remember the Gonzalez family, Diane and Mikey. Remember Amanda, Jimmy, Kathy, Abigail, Emmy, Emily, Ethan, and Tim today. Remember Jean and Jenny, Chris M, Steve, touch him in his back even now. Pauline L and Pauline and Gloria today. Greg Laskowski, touch Sister Gina even now, God, as she 
mourns for the loss of her 97-year-old grandmother, who even now is in your presence, receiving her eternal reward. One day we will join Gina's grandmother and all the saints who, who are in your presence. But while we are here, we are separated by the body and we miss their presence. Cause her to remember the good things and the good times. Replace grief and sorrow with comfort and love. Today, in the name of Jesus. God, remember all of those who have lost loved ones this week, this month. Remember all of those, Father, who are missing the embrace of loved ones that they have not seen or touched, whether they be here in this uh, plane of earth with us or they be in heaven. Touch, strengthen, heal, set free, and deliver them now in the name of Jesus. We are so grateful to you for hearing our prayer. Most of all, Lord, I pray that you would touch this church, every heart, every mind, every spirit. Cause us to be one as you and the Father are one. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Saints, please join me in the prayer that the Lord taught to his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> This morning are from Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 through 9 and Revelations chapter 3 verses 19 to 22 all in the New International Version. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, but God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Revelations. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. 
Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on the throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Blessed are we to hear the word of the Lord. Amen. 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 Break Chapel. My name is Pastor Warren Manavault, and I, I bid you greetings here from 381 South Main Street in Atterboro, from the family and friends here at Canterbury Chapel, where faith in Jesus Christ is our foundation. To those joining us via social media, thank you for tuning in this morning, and happy Fourth of July to all of you. The title of our sermon this morning is, Where Are You? 
where are you? A few weeks ago, I asked you how long would you waver between two opinions? If God is God, then serve him. For the time to be indecisive about who we will serve is long expired, and it's time that we all grew up as disciples of Jesus Christ and do the work of our Heavenly Father, as he did when he walked among us. Then on Father's Day, we explored who is your father, because the intentions and desires of our heart actually reveal which father we actually belong to. For many say they're followers of Christ, but what they say or what they do when we examine their fruit actually reveals that they don't follow the Spirit of God at all. Just last week, we saw how Paul, the father to the Gentile church and the father to Timothy in the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, said, For this reason I sent you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Jesus Christ, which agrees with what I've taught everywhere in the church. He did this because he wanted them to keep the faith. He wanted them to stay on track, to, to keep the course that they had begun, and to maintain that course until they came into eternity. He wanted them, as their spiritual father, to do what was right. He understood where they were in their spiritual condition, where they were in their walk with Christ, but he also wanted them and Timothy to know where they were, or were not, so to speak, and how to get or stay in the right place, that is, right standing or righteousness in God. Which brings me back to our lesson for today, which is, where are you. Of all the questions that have ever been asked, or ever have been asked, throughout all of man's history, these three little words are the most profound question to ever have been asked of a man. Where are you? But believe it or not, it's actually not the first question to ever have been recorded in the Bible. It's actually the second question to ever have appeared in scripture. Did you know that? Anybody know what the first question was? The first question that's found in the Bible actually came from Satan. When he said, did God really say you must not eat from any tree? These two questions reveal a vast difference between the characters of the two speakers, God and Satan. They also reveal two different choices of eternal destinies. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? What an interesting way to put the question. Ryan, did he really say it? Did he actually say that, Claire? Satan's question to the woman reveals his true nature, by the way. For his nature is to deceive. All we ever need to know about the enemy of our souls, all we ever need to know about his true nature is that his fruit is deception. And he can never bear good fruit, and he can never be trusted. That's why Jesus called him the father of lies in John 8, 44. He is the source of all lies and deception and a murderer from the beginning, it also says. And we see his fruit played out here in Genesis chapter 3. Yes, he was a killer and a destroyer from the very beginning. The strategies he employs are manifold and at work at many levels but their foundation is always the same, deception. In Jesus' great dissertation upon the, about the end times, he repeatedly warns us and warns his hearers at that time not to be deceived. During this revelation, Satan will be at his most convincing by working great wonders of miracles and deception, Matthew 24 tells us. This is the thing that you have to be careful of as a believer today in the 21st century. This is what you have to watch out for when you watch the news and you read the internet. There is deception all around. 
Nobody knows what truth really is anymore. There is one spin, and then there's another spin. And its goal is to convince you of a particular truth, whether it's the truth or not. We're smart, we all see it happening. But somehow we still fall for the okie doke. We still fall for the trick. We still get deceived. Satan's question to the woman was very much like this. It's really designed to cause her to question God's character, specifically God's goodness. He wasn't really questioning whether or not God was good. Oh yes, he was. He was putting that in her mind. He knew God was good, but he didn't. He, he, he wanted to see if she knew that. See, a, a week or so ago, I said, keep the faith, right? And when I'm talking about keeping the faith, we go, yeah, well, I keep the faith. Well, do you? Because if you don't hold fast to the things that are written in this book behind me, or the things that are represented on my computer that represent the Bible here, then how can you keep the faith? How will you know the truth if you refuse to hold on to the truth? See, the world presents you something that looks good, and it sounds good, and it's a philosophy of man. And we go, well, I think it should be this way or that way. And we say, well, I'm a Republican, or I'm a Democrat, or I'm independent. All of that means nothing. What is the truth according to what God says? Because if we're really going to be believers in Christ, if we're really truly going to act like Christians, we have to make up in our minds that we're going to be on the Lord's side. We're going to follow what the word of God says, despite what popular culture says. Despite how popular culture defines certain things that we know violate scripture, we have to decide either the God, God's word is true or it's a lie. And if God's word is true, then we have to follow it. Satan's question was designed to cause her to question God's character. All the things that happen to us in our modern society are designed to get us as Christians to question what we really believe. How many Christians do you know when you talk to them don't really sound like Christians? Because the things that they say that they believe in don't sound Christian to me. They don't line up with what God teaches. Oh, but I'm a Catholic. But are you a Christian? I'm a Presbyterian. But are you a follower of Jesus Christ? God's not going to ask you for your baptismal certificate. He's going to examine the fruit in your heart. Beloved. Satan succeeded in his plan in convincing the woman to doubt God's goodness. How do we know that? She ate the fruit. That's how we know. She ate it. However, do you realize that Satan's main objective was not the woman at all, but the man and the place that God had given man in his kingdom? Ooh, it's mighty quiet in this church. Ooh, I feel a chill going through my spine here. His objective was the man, not the woman. His objective was the man's place that God had given man in his kingdom. What place are you talking about, Pastor? The dominion over God's creation. God had made man, hear this, in his image and in his likeness. And he gave him rulership over all that God created. Genesis 1, 26, go and read it. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness, and let them what? Rule. Let them have dominion over the what? The birds in the air and everything that moves on the ground. You guys know this, right? This is the place that God put man. And by the way, when I say man, I do mean men and women. Okay? This is what Satan wanted. He wanted to rule. Not just over God's creation, but over God himself. He wanted to be God. Oh, Pastor, you know, that's not, we don't, we don't really know. Well, yes, we do. Revelation 12, 7 through 17 says this. Then the war broke out in heaven. 
Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, there it is, who leads the whole world astray, there it is. He was hurled down to earth, and his angels with him. You see, beloved, Satan had already been beaten in eternity in his coup attempt in heaven and now in the Garden of Eden. This was his counterinsurgency strategy. If I can't steal God's godship away from him, perhaps I can steal the dominion from God's image and likeness known as man. You guys following me? If I can't be God, I can take the place of the people God made to look like him. And I can take what God gave them, and in that way, I become a ruler. So he reasoned. He could not directly deceive the man, but he could do an end run attack on the woman and through her, through her defeat the man. Sadly, we know he was right. Adam was there with his wife, and he clearly recognized the problem with what was being proposed by the serpent. He knew firsthand what God had commanded him not to do. Genesis 2, 15 through 17. You guys are like, what, Pastor? You know, that's when God took the man and he put him in the garden and he commanded him, you may eat freely from any trees in the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Yeah. Adam got that command directly from God. Eve got it from Adam. Right? You guys are like, I don't know, Pastor. I'm not commenting on anything. <laughs> <laughs> he knew firsthand what God commanded him not to do. And yet, here's that word again, he chose. He chose to eat. After watching, nothing happened to his wife Eve after she ate first. He had a little bit of sense, right? He watched to see what was going to happen first. He says, hmm, she's eating it. She, she looks okay, right? Yes, I know, brothers. We really don't like that part, right? We want to believe that Adam was somewhere else gardening or fishing or communing with creation, right? He was hunting or something, right? But that's not what the Bible says, Ernie. The Bible teaches us plainly in Genesis 3, 6, when the woman saw that the fruit was good, for, that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable to gain wisdom, she took some of it and she ate it. Here's the rub, men. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. So where was Adam? With her. He wasn't somewhere else. He wasn't gardening and fishing and whatever else we like to think he was doing. He was right there with Eve watching the whole thing go down. And he chose not to rebuke the serpent. He chose not to correct the serpent. He chose not to tell the serpent to get out of, get out of the garden. He chose not to say to his wife, hey, wait a minute. God told us not to eat from that tree. Get out of here. Let's, let's walk away. Let's go tell God what this, this character is trying to do to us. He did not do that. Instead, he sat there and said, hmm, let's see how this works out. And she ate, and he said, well, she's all right, so maybe I'll take a little piece myself. Adam was not deceived, everybody. He made a choice for himself. And guess what he also did? He made a choice for all of us as well who would be born after him. Thanks for that, Adam. There's going to be a long line to kick Adam in the tail when we get to heaven. <laughs> His eating did not result from deception. He knew what he was doing. You know, that's true of many of us today. We grew up in church. We know what the Bible says. We know right from wrong. But we make choices that disagree with what God expects of us, and we know what we're doing. We're not deceived. See, people in the world that don't go to church, that don't have a pastor like me to preach to you every week, week in and week out, what the gospel says, they can, they can plead ignorance. But you can. His eating did not result from deception. He knew what he was doing. The scripture places blame of sin on Adam, not Eve, by the way. 
Although Adam made this choice, it is unlikely that Adam really understood, or should I say really appreciated, the true consequences of his choice. It cost him, and us by the way, dominion over the earth. And it turned the rule of the world over to Satan and plunged the earth under a curse which resulted in decay, death, and after that point, every living thing on the planet began to die. Not just Adam, but everything. All the animals, all the vegetation, everything that had, was never supposed to die, started to die. You want to talk about man's effect on the planet? That's affecting the planet right there. All because of the choice we made not to keep the faith, not to listen and hold to the word of God, and to believe the lie because we didn't honor our Heavenly Father and believe his word instead of the enemy's. We became lost sons of another father at that very moment. And we were drawn into believing his word over the truth so much so that some of us can't even recognize the truth if we slapped it, slapped it with it with a sledgehammer. And we, we, we lost our way, not able to discern right from wrong, truth from error, not able to not sin now that we know what sin is. That was the rub. Which brings me back to God's first question. Where are you? God's first question that ever appears in the Bible. Where are you? Verse 9, chapter 3 of Genesis. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are Adam? Where are you? After Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they recognized that they were naked. Now, I could go on and on and on about what that means. But thankfully, I know you've got barbecues to get to, so I won't do that to you today. After Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, they recognized that they were naked. But this is no ordinary nakedness, beloved. They may have been, hear this, prior to eating the fruit, they may have been clothed with what we call a glory that vanished after they ate. In other words, prior to eating, they were perfect, innocent, without spot or blemish or wrinkle, made in the image and likeness of God. And they reflected the perfect beauty and glory of God. I often liken this to the story in Exodus 34, 29 through 35, about how when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law, his face was so radiant from speaking directly with God that Aaron and the Israelites couldn't bear to look at him because of the glory that emanated from his face from talking with God. They couldn't stand looking at it, so, so Moses had to wear a veil over his face whenever he talked to the people because the glory of God was so bright upon his face from just conversing with God on the mountain. Adam and Eve wore this type of glory, I believe, upon themselves from their creation. But now that they've execrated themselves, from this radiant glory of God, that means they stepped out of being consecrated and now they've been execrated from God. They would now see themselves apart from God, which had to reveal to them that now that they are inadequate and imperfect, that they really were without God. In other words, they were no longer like God. They were something else entirely. And they became self-aware in all the worst possible ways. Not only did they know this, but now they are ashamed of what they have become. This is what it's meant by they knew they were naked. And this was true. The true nature, I should say, of the knowledge of good and evil tree, of which the Heavenly Father warned them they weren't ready for. <laughs> it wasn't that God wasn't good. It was that God knew what was good for them. He knew what they were ready for and what they were not ready for, which is why he denied them that tree in the first place. 
Satan had deceived Eve by, by extension her husband into believing it was something desirable which God was withholding from them. But in reality, this was this good was actually grief, sadness, regret, heartbreak, sin, and death. And because of the profound shame that is sin, Adam and Eve felt their first act was to do what? To try to cover themselves. They attempted this by sewing together fig leaves. They fashioned crude, insufficient clothing onto themselves that could not truly cover or take away what they had really done. Nor would it hide them from an om omnipresent, that means ever present, an omniscient, that means all knowing God. It was a representative act of what human beings do when we try to cover over our sin when we try to excuse our failures, when we try to rationalize evil that we see in the world. These fig leaves were a pathetic coping mechanism like drugs or alcohol or anything else we use to dull our minds from dealing with who we really are in our lives without God. And just like Adam and Eve, our forefathers, so to speak, we hide ourselves. We hide ourselves in our work. We hide ourselves in our leisure. We hide ourselves in whatever activity we engage in so we don't have to deal with what God really expects of us as human beings that he made in his image and in his likeness. In Genesis 3.8, we read, God walking in the garden after they had discovered they were naked. This seemed to be his habit, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And these walks were meant for him to meet and talk with and, and fellowship with Adam and Eve. Prior to their eating, prior to their sin, this must have been the highlight of their day. But now they were afraid of God and they hid from him. How often do we do that? How often when we feel that we're not where we're supposed to be in our lives, where we have failed God, Again and again, whatever the situation may be, instead of coming to church or coming to the chapel or getting on our knees and asking God for forgiveness or repenting of our sins, we hide from God. Too often people tell me that they will come to God once they figure out some things out about themselves in their lives. I have things I need to fix, Pastor, and I need to work on myself. But beloved, you don't realize that until you come to God, the great physician, you will never be fixed. You can't fix yourself. Only God can do that. You will never truly be healed, set free, or delivered from where you are in your spiritual or natural state of your life until you stop hiding from God and instead run to him for forgiveness, restoration in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is calling you and me, all of us. He's calling you, me, your family, our communities, our nation, this world. Where are you? He's calling us like he called Adam and Eve when they were hiding in the trees in the garden. And he's saying, son, daughter, I love you. Where are you? Come to me. Just like he knew where Adam and Eve were, he knows where you are as well. God wasn't the one who was lost. Adam and Eve were. God is not the one who doesn't know where he is. You are. He's calling you, pleading with you to answer his question. Where are you? He says in our text in Revelation, to those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I'm knocking at the door. I'm waiting for you. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. This is what he was coming down to do in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. He was coming to sup with them, to fellowship with them. And he wants to do that with each one of us today. Don't you see, beloved? He says, I know where you are and how you got where you are, and I'm standing here ready not only to correct what you have done to yourself, but I'm also willing to forgive you and to restore you, and, and, and I've meant to turn you back to the way you were in the beginning. Spotless and without sin. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, Luke 19, 10 tells us. Do you hear my voice? I am knocking at the door of your heart. Will you let me in? 
So that my glory will not just be on your face, but my glory will be in you. Today, this day that you hear my voice, do not harden your heart. Where are you, beloved? To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne, Jesus said, whoever hears, has ears, let him hear what the Spirit of God says to the churches. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit of God says to you and me today. Do not be deceived. Turn to me and live. Do not hide yourselves from me. Turn back to me and be restored. Do not be afraid of me, for I am intimately familiar with your human weaknesses, and I want to deliver you from yourself and fill you with my presence. But beloved, where are you? For I tell you truly, when the Son of Man comes in all his glory, will he find faith in the earth? Amen. 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 <clears throat> Please stand with me. sound of my voice would turn their face back towards you, would open their hearts and minds to receive not only the impartation of your words, but the infilling of the Holy Spirit now and for all eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Ministers, please give out the uh, envelopes today. received from the Lord 
I also pass on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after dinner, he took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So then whoever eats this, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment unto themselves. That is why many among you are weak, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if you were more discerning regarding ourselves, we would not be judged by the Lord in this way, and disciplined along with the world when he, joins, when he judges the world. Excuse me. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, wait for each other. Anyone who is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you might not meet together, resulting in judgment. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Please take a moment at this time to examine yourselves before God. If there be any sin in you, or anything that's not like God, Ask him to forgive it and remove it and to replace it with his presence, his truth, and his spirit. Please examine yourself at this time. we thank you today for the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because we know Father that he was beaten for our transgressions, he was wounded for our sins and the chastisement of our peace fell upon him and by his stripes Father we are healed and so we are grateful to you today for the healing that we receive in Christ through the body of Christ please take and eat the bread this time Father, we are grateful for this cup, which represents the blood of the eternal sacrifice that our Lord and Savior gave on our behalf. We know in the scripture, Father, that he took his blood into the Holy of Holies of Heaven, and he smeared it upon the mercy seat in heaven once and for all, and for all eternity, paying the price for all of mankind, past, present, and future forever undoing what happened in Genesis chapter 3 and returning us to your family, to, you, to making us your sons and daughters once again. This is a symbol of our spiritual DNA and we are grateful for it today in Jesus' name. Please drink it this time.
Amen. 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 Please be prepared to give it this time. my beloved dear friends since you have been forewarned be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless people and fall from your secure position but I pray that you would grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to him alone be all the glory both now and forevermore amen, amen. please join us in our final hymn majesty <clears throat> gifts that I hold in my hand, Father, that were given in faith. I pray that they will be utilized to further the gospel of Jesus Christ in this community and beyond. Thank you, Father, for the hearts of those who gave. We return to them according to what was in their heart, 
even beyond what they could ask or think. And opportunity and favor and blessings and healings, whatever it is that they need, Father, exceed their wildest expectation by the power and blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you for these gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Thank you so much for coming this morning. I bless you in the name of the Lord and I bid you all a happy 4th of July. Stay safe. God bless you. Amen. 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 Amen.